Depression is often unrelated to any circumstances in life in which to attribute the depression. Upper cervical chiropractors have been helping these types of patients for years now, but how? What does addressing the craniocervical junction have to do with depression? Dr. Evans and I discuss this research and more on this episode of the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show. I've also done an overview and summary video you can find on the channel if you'd like to see that. Hi there, I'm Dr. Kevin Leach here with the Chiropractic Deep Dive Podcast, bringing you the most important research and information on conservative primary spine care, upper cervical chiropractic care, and traditional chiropractic care. These research reviews, interviews, and episodes are made for you, whether you're a medical doctor, patient, or concerned family member or friend. The goal of these shows is to bring awareness of the importance of taking care of our spine and the impact it has on our health and the hundreds of different health conditions it could cause without us realizing it. I'm really trying to bring value with these, so I'd appreciate commenting on the videos, hitting the like button, and sharing them with as many people as you can. You never know who might need to see it. And consider subscribing to the channel so you can see all the other episodes and videos coming out. Thank you so, so much. I truly appreciate your support. Now on to the show. Hey, welcome back everyone to the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show. This is episode number nine. I'm Dr. Kevin Leach and I am here once again with my friend and colleague, Dr. Tyler Evans. How are you, sir? Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, okay, so the episode's research review title is Depression and the Cranial Cervical Junction, a look at the hemispheric model by Robert Kessinger et al. published in Neuroscience Discovery. So this paper is looking for a correlation between the side of atlas laterality, the side shifting misalignment of the top bone in the neck, and depression. Uh, does the atlas shifting to either side have more or less of an effect on depression? The study found that both left and right atlas laterality groups had statistically significant improvements. However, the right atlas laterality group measured more depression to start and also reported and responded more favor favorably to care than the atlas, left atlas laterality group, which, was, which is quite interesting in and of itself. Uh, Dr. Evans, what are your uh, thoughts on the, uh, the research here? Yeah, so hot off the press. This one just came out. Uh, it's 2020. Um, yeah, so this is uh, this is a good friend of ours, Dr. Rob Kessinger. Uh, I know you worked with him in the past and are familiar with him. Uh, I worked with him a, a bit with he. The, he's on the uh, the uh, upper cervical council, uh, the ICA's upper cervical council that I'm a member of and, and a director of. Um, so I work with him quite a bit and uh, you know, they, they are producing some fantastic research. This paper just came out last year. They did one on HRV and pulse pressure. Um, and he's done some other papers in the past. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, this is a great, a great uh, addition to the upper cervical uh, stack of research and it's headed in a direction that's more brain based, which is fascinating. To the uh, to the effects of the craniocervical junction, right? So right. So we've done a lot of uh, episodes so far on hydrodynamics in the craniocervical junction and how that affects brain health and just health overall. And now we're getting into possibly a little bit more of the neurological aspects of how of how this is doing it. So um, so j before we get into this, uh, Doctor, did you finish your thoughts there overall? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Before we get into this paper, just out of curiosity, what has been your experience in your clinic with depression and any patients with your depression, uh, with, with your patients? Well, so right off the top, you know, I can't go in and, and uh, say right listing. Of course. Because I, I, I haven't done a, yeah, I haven't done a retrospective analysis. But just lately. overall. But what I can say overall, uh, and this is, this is really cool, um, is that I, and from myself, I am a post-concussion post -concussion syndrome recovered patient, right? So I have dealt with concussion issues 
I've had post-concussion syndrome. I didn't know I had it. It was actually back before they even really talked about it like they do today. Um, I went head over. I mean, I've had quite a few. I played football in high school. Um, a lot of head and neck injuries there. Uh, pretty big ones. And then uh, I played, uh, or I was riding my bike actually in chiropractic college and I went over uh, a hole and my wheel came off, whatever. Terrible story, but I went into the pavement and cracked my helmet. Good thing I had a helmet on, but uh, I didn't realize it at the time uh, how detrimental that was to my health. And it really messes with your neurology. Um, and I've had patient after patient. And so I've shared my story and it's interesting as you start to talk about this with people, they start to connect with it. And I've had patient after patient with post-concussion syndrome. I can tell you post-concussion syndrome, hands down, one of the major, and it's in the literature, one of the major symptoms of post-concussion syndrome is increase in depression, right? Um, it, it, and it goes along with that, that CTE condition we were talking about with the NFL players. Um, there's there's some interesting science that's coming out about you know injuries to the head and neck and what it does to mood and how it alters mood and I, I I've seen it quite a bit in my practice where these patients I have I have I've had a handful of 18 year olds that are in high school um, 18 or you know high school age 16 to 18 that um, play sports get get concussions and literally start to go down a dark hole. And they say it like that. They say, I was scared because I was getting depressed. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't, and I don't want to go back there. That's what they tell, this is, I, this is not one person. This is many stories that I hear over time. And I mean, I had the same experience. It's literally, I've had the, the symptomatic changes of upper cervical turning the lights back on for people's life. Right. So I'm sure you probably had similar stories, but um, and then in terms of the, uh, you know, direction uh, of misalignment, if you want to real briefly, I can touch on that. Uh, if you, you want to go into it later, we, we can talk about it later. What do you what do you prefer? Would you prefer to talk um, about it later? Yeah, we can talk about it later. OK. All right. So let's roll from there then. But okay. yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of patients in my office with specifically post concussion syndrome that. Uh, depression is is uh, connected for yeah. sure. You know, fortunately, a lot of people put uh, depression and anxiety on the initial paperwork. It's not oh, yeah. their primary complaint, so it's not something that, that we focus on. Right. However, it's, and, so, and, and I say that because I don't go into a lot of history on their depression. How long has it been there? What have they tried? How to treat it, et cetera, et cetera. Because most of the time, people just aren't coming in directly for depression. They just have it and they've got neck pain and headaches or whatever else they're, they're, they're coming in with. But one thing that I always do is every single complaint that every patient has, I ask them about improvements on every single re-exam. So in the beginning, that's about every 30, you know, 30 days, 45 days. I'll ask them about that. And even if I don't, even if the patient hasn't put depression, anxiety or something along those lines, three of the questions that I ask every single patient on every single re-exam. Number one is, how is your overall sleep? Has it improved? Number one. Number two, how's your overall energy? Has it improved at all? And number three, has your overall sense of well-being improved? And that can be kind of the other side of the spectrum of depression. And so, because we get so often like, yeah, you know, I just feel better. I just, I'm, I'm happier. I'm less irritable around, you know, so they, maybe they weren't in a depressed state, but their, their outlook on life is, is improved. And the reason I ask those three is because it seems like those three all, almost always improve for all of my patients. And so many, many times they report that they've had an improvement with those things. Uh, so you know, clinically for me, clinically for you, you know, we see it a lot, but that's what this paper is really trying to address is we know that anecdotally and clinically, we see an improvement here. But Dr. Kessinger went in to ask the question, well, because I think he's done some Carrick stuff as well, yeah. I would imagine. He's, I, I think he is a neurodiplomate. Um, so he wanted to know, okay, so 
he, he may have seen Carrick's study or just maybe he saw exactly what, you know, what he wanted to study in this, in this research is that he saw in the Carrick research that adjusting the right side of the neck stimulated the left side. And what the theory is behind that is that the left, the left prefrontal cortex being inactive or lower in activity is kind of overwhelmed by the, the right side. And so there's an imbalance there. And when the left side is depre depressed, literally act, the activity is depressed and the patients tend to become depressed. So Dr. Kessinger, I imagine he thought, okay, well, let's figure out if these patients that have a right laterality that would get adjusted on the right compared to the left laterality who would be adjusted on the left, let's see how these patients um, are correlated to depression. And so the, the, the paper is, they did the uh, GDS. Yeah. GDS. Um, Goldberg depression Goldberg. scale. So yeah. they did a Goldberg depression scale. They would say in this paper that one of the limitations was that they didn't have neuroimaging or neurophysiological analysis, et cetera. So they did intake forms, which still has clinical validation. Uh, and they found actually some decent results. And so some of those results, uh, and like I, like I said with just a, a summary statement before, is that they did find that people with the right laterality were more depressed. And I believe it was... What's laterality, Dr. Leach? Oh, uh, laterality for, for everyone listening. Uh, so the laterality just means that the atlas bone that sits underneath the skull has gone lateral or to the side on the right or on the left. And so there's a, a misalignment in the craniocervical junction. And so this, is, this was analyzed through x-rays, through the knee, chest, upper cervical specific technique um, through, the, um, through, that, through that organization, which Dr. Kessinger uh, could be the founder of or, or very important in that, in that organization. Mm -hmm. So what they found was that the right, side, right laterality were worse in their symptoms, but then after the intervention of, of the upper cervical care, is they actually improved more than the left laterality group. But the interesting idea here is that if the left laterality group improved also with their depression, well, what's the mechanism there if it's not just the crossing over of the right-sided stimulation, neurologically crossing over to the left prefrontal cortex? And, and, and also another question would be, is that adjustment, is that stimulating and and exciting the prefrontal cortex, or is it bringing it back to an, a neurological balance from left to right, right? Is it a stimulant or is it a restoration of balance? I'd like to think possibly both, okay. yeah. So, um, but it would also lead to the question of it's, if it's a left laterality and that's corrected and they improve, well, what's the mechanism there? And they get into a little bit of the HRV and the autonomic nervous system balancing that out seeing improvements and, and so they they show some and they cite some medical literature talking about the correlation between proper autonomic nervous system function being correlated to depression or or lack thereof right yeah any thoughts on any of that yeah uh, you know this is uh it's, it's it's fascinating it starts a lot of different conversations and man we could go down a lot of rabbit holes right um, just to give a little historical perspective, um, the first chiropractic clinic actually absorbed a what's called what was called the Clearview Sanitarium in Davenport, Iowa, and you know this was back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So the research back then wasn't as um, uh, published. I mean, they're 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 not layers on layers of of studies that have been published on this, but. Uh, they had some pretty fantastic results and they were only doing upper cervical care in this clinic. And this was back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s in Davenport, Iowa, the Clearview Sanitarium. And there's some videos on that actually on the Chiropractic History YouTube page that you can look up. But, uh, you know, this goes back through the history of chiropractic is that, um, you know, chiropractic has been pigeonholed and boxed into, uh, you know, neck pain or back pain or headaches. But what we're finding in this paper are some of the, and what was cool about this paper, I think, too, is you can look through the list of citations. He's included some fantastic citations that are 
some of the best papers in brain changes from chiropractic care. Heidi Havoc, man, some of the stuff she does down there in New Zealand, it is cutting edge and it's, it's beautiful stuff saying changes in the prefrontal cortex, which is what makes us human. Right. Right. Yeah, so, we, we need to review some of those papers. <clears throat> we will. We yeah. will. It's on the list. Yeah. But, but so my point is, is this paper is, is cool because it's a step, right? Like it's okay. Now we can take a step from this paper and do more papers. Um, but it goes all the way back to the beginning of chiropractic with BJ Palmer in the upper cervical clinic in Davenport, Iowa, where they were saying like, look, you know, chiropractic is not just for neck pain or back pain, but we're seeing changes in mood and, and depression is a, you know, a, symptom of that. Um, and in this paper, we're, we're talking about right and left laterality and trying to specify, you know, some of the brain uh, pathways, which um, these papers in, that have been cited in this really, really do a good job of outlining. But, you know, we're not getting deep into the neurology. So there's a lot of room for improvement on, on you know, finding out what are the exact pathways and, and how is all that um, connected. But yeah, and I'll say it in my office, uh, we do see more, so it's really interesting because we do see more right laterality uh, in our office than we do left, uh, just in general. Um, and, and I would say for the Blair practitioners, that's been a conversation that a lot of us have had at conferences is that yeah, we tend to see more of those right lateralities um, now. Any thoughts on the why? Why that is. Um, there's a lot of reasons. I think, you know, probably right hand dominant has a lot to do with it, right? So right side of the body, you're using that more wear and tear, that sort of a thing. Um, but it also might have a lot to do with this brain connection. I mean, everything we do. And so this, this comes back to like who we are as humans, right? Like we could go deep on this. Um, our prefrontal cortex is what makes us humans. Our, our ability to judge uh, critically think, uh, that all comes from, from the frontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex. And if you're talking about being a better human, improving overall function of the brain, go to the prefrontal cortex. And you're seeing in this paper that they're showing these changes. And yeah, so, you know, in chiropractic, uh, we see changes in human function. And it would make sense that, you know, if you adjust them on the right, it changes the left side of the brain uh, in terms of the, the cer cerebrum. Um, if we're talking about the cerebellum, I believe that it's more of a ipsilateral change. So that means same side change. So if you adjust on the right, it changes the right side of the cerebellum. Cerebellum is more in charge of um, motor control, um, you know, where, where we're at in space, that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, it would make sense that, uh, you know, right-sided problem, um, you know, if we adjust on the right, we're, we're making more change in that left side that's the weaker side, that's the depressive state. So if that, that left side is weaker, you're going to have more of those depression symptoms, right? Um, and that, that's, that tends to happen to everybody, right? Like a lot of people have anxiety, a lot of people have depression. It's a common thing that we see. You know, uh, and on that note, it was something I wanted to, to, to point out as well that I found really interesting is that the proposed mechanism for that left inhibited prefrontal cortex is that if there's less activity of the prefrontal cortex, putting inhibitory input, this is get kind of confusing, yeah. but inhibitory input into the amygdala, mm -hmm. right? Because those, because those pathways that go into the amygdala down-regulate the amygdala. So if the amygdala is not getting those inhibitory messages, those emotions are going to be higher, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. means those depressive states are going to be, are going to be higher. So that's, that's, the, that's one of the interesting things that I wanted to, to bring up. But also bringing, bringing back what we've been doing on other episodes as far as hydrodynamics, in this research, they do, they do state that they found decreased blood flow and metabolism on things like functional MRI in that left prefrontal cortex, which means, again, that's another hydrodynamics kind of conversation there, which, uh, which again, pulling all this together, if there's, if there's decreased neurological input 
if there's decreased cerebral spine, you know, if there's de decreased function, whether it's neurological, whether it's, you know, blood flow, whether it's cerebral spinal fluid, whatever's, whatever's affecting that to, to decrease it, that's going to affect something. So all of this is tying together and, and, and just giving more evidence of how the craniocervical junction and, and what it is that we do could be restoring all kinds of normal functions, which in turn improve symptoms because we're just restoring normal function, not necessarily treating those symptoms specifically. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to, I, I thought that was a good detail to bring up. Yeah, it is. No, it's great. And it, it's, it just goes back to, you know, yes, we are adjusting the bone back into the right place, the misalignment. Um, and we talk about that all the time, but uh, to remember there are nerves inside of there, there are blood vessels inside of there, there's CSF fluid inside of there. Um, and all of that tissue can be affected and it all has uh, counterbalanced effects, you know, so you change one, you change the other. Uh, so it's not just adjust here, pain goes away here, right. you know, we're affecting above and below. Right. Which sometimes isn't, isn't as immediately obvious, right? And healing needs to happen a lot, you know, in this society we live in. We want treatment, we want symptomatic relief, we want improvement right away. But um, this study that Kessinger did, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see that improvement. Um, and especially with those, with that right laterality group more so, which would imply there's definitely, not definitely, which would imply there's most likely at least two mechanisms happening when or adjusting more. When, or more you know, like yeah. you know like yeah. there, there could be all kinds of things going on when we restore normal function i mean right it could be hundreds of things for all you know for all we know yep um but just to kind of give the listeners an idea there was 104 participants 67 yep. female 47 male they did six weeks of care they got the GDS and they also did an SF uh, 36 beforehand. Mm -hmm. So they were looking at overall health, but then, you know, they were focusing on that Goldberg, uh, what is it again? The Goldberg depression, the depression. scale. And they found yeah. again, statistically significant, not just improvement, but what research would indicate a statistically significant mm -hmm. improvement uh, with patients with that depression. So uh, really, really cool you know, findings in a really uh, interesting niche in, in, in what most people wouldn't associate something uh, being helped with chiropractic care. Yeah. 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 It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, any, uh, anything that we didn't go over or any, any other highlights that you'd want to, that you'd want to hit on? No, I think we got it. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll give a little conclusion statement here. So, you know, in my opinion, the researchers, uh, they definitely, you know, indeed found evidence supporting their claim that a right atlas laterality may contribute to decrease activity in the left prefrontal cortex of the brain. You know, considering number one, patients were more depressed that had a right atlas laterality. And number two, those patients with le right laterality had more improvement than those with the left laterality. However, patients with left laterality still had improvements, which, which would suggest that's, that's not the whole story, which is talked about in the discussion. Uh, either way, there's evidence that suggests conservative, non-pharmacological spine care using the knee, chest, upper cervical specific chiropractic care can help patients on a statistically significant level with depression, regardless of the exact mechanism through which it is achieved. Uh, if you find yourself, yeah. You know, DSM, we talked about this the other day, the DSM, it's right here, the, the the DSM-5 criteria for major depressive disorder, right? So you talk about application in a clinical space where we're talking to other providers, not just patients, but other providers. You know, it's like, hey, if you're a person out there and you're, you, you're, you're struggling with depression, anxiety, um, and obviously this paper isn't on anxiety, but uh, it's kind of, it gets kind of grouped in there. Um, if you're struggling with it as a person, look at other solutions other than chemicals, right? Chemical medication uh, for something that may actually be like a structural imbalance um, that you can affect by getting adjusted. That's natural and helps your body heal from the inside out without having negative side effects, which many of these medications do, right? Yeah. Um, 
So, yeah. and then from a, from a clinician's perspective as well, it's like, hey, look, why don't we try a less invasive uh, means of care than a chemical medication that might have side effects, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, it could have a significant effect uh, on it. Even when, even if the patient is on uh, depression medication and they find that that's potentially helping them a little bit, but they're still not where they want to be, get some upper cervical care and they could, that could be a significant factor uh, that could potentially help them. Right. I think, I think the most important thing, and again, with what we're doing here is bringing awareness uh, of a potential piece of the puzzle, you know, it's, you know, and that's just a, you know, that's, it's, it's double when, when someone's got depression, maybe they've tried so much already and maybe none of it's working. Now they're even more depressed because nothing's working to get them out of it. And so if they don't even have the awareness that this care exists and could potentially help them, then they don't have the choice whether they even want to give it a shot or not. You just talk about that number. You know, how many people are depressed in the United States? Try, try something else, you know? Yeah. Try different, yeah. different definitely, things. definitely an option. And, and again, since, you know, this, this research was only for uh, you know, 114 people, 104 people. So it's like, it's an option. People should, yeah. you know, people need to know and be aware that it's, that it's a possibility. So, yep. yeah. And, and that, that was going to be one, another final thought is that if, if you're watching this, if you have depression, if you have a loved one with depression, you know, find, find an upper cervical chiropractor. And if you're not sure what that means, our episode number three, we go into detail about that. So you can find that on my YouTube channel. You can find it on Dr. Evans' YouTube channel. Uh, we go, we go plenty into that. So any last thoughts, doctor? No, I think we got it. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Evans, and we'll see you next time. See ya. Awesome. Okay. That's it for this episode. So what did you learn that fascinated you or surprised you about the research today? Join or start the conversation in the comments below. Hey, thanks so much for watching. To watch more of our research shows, click or tap the screen right there. To subscribe to the channel, click or tap the screen right there. Until next time, I'm Dr. Kevin Leach with the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show, bringing awareness to conservative primary spine care, upper cervical chiropractic care, and traditional chiropractic. Until next time, take care and take care of your spine. It's the only one you'll ever have. Thank you.